inviting me. I'm just always happy to do things for, for and with all of you. So thank you. Uh, so I'm Hortensia Soto. I'm a professor at Colorado State. I'm in the math department. Um, I'm from Mexico. That's where I was born. That's why the crazy name. Uh, but I was raised in Western Nebraska and actually Morrill, Nebraska, which is 16 miles from Scott's Bluff. I went to school at Shadron State um, and got my undergraduate there and my first master's there and then went and got my PhD. Uh, I got a second master's at the University of Arizona and then my PhD, which is in mathematics education uh, from the University of Northern Colorado. And my work really centers on training and working with uh, perspective and in-service K through 16 teachers. Um, and so that's kind of how this uh, work came to be. Um, let's see what else I should say about myself. I have a son, his name is Miguel, he's the apple in my eye. This is his little Christmas tree with all his little ornaments he's always made and his little shoes. I talked about that earlier from when he was a little boy. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And uh, we're gonna have a small group. So this is gonna make things very, very easy for Stephanie. Cause uh, Stephanie, I'm gonna massage things as we go along. Cause we'll probably just have one big group and we'll separate them into two. Okay. All right. So are you all ready to get started? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michelle, is there anything else you need to say before we start? Um, no, just thanks for coming and keep watching for more of these. We're trying to, you know, do our all-star lineup. And that, Shelby, I believe you're leading one. Do, did we choose a date for you yet? Sometime in February. Not okay, sure. sometime in February. And Deb just got finished leading one. And so, um, you know, if any of the rest of you are interested, let me know. We have Susie caught up um, next. She just finished writing a book about, um, uh, let's see building um oh I, the word escapes me right now um persistence or some you know what's the other word that we use for persistence um but in elementary uh students and uh with teachers so hers will have more of an elementary focus but she's um coming up next so Perfect. thanks for and keep sharing and spreading the word and we'll get more and more people here great okay i'm going to go ahead and share my powerpoint um Oh, wait, that's not it. Uh, slideshow. Can you all see that okay? All right, so I'm going to talk about acting out mathematics and I'm not gonna do a lot of talking, mostly I want you to experience this. And I want to start off with a short story to kind of let you know um, how this work kind of came to be. And I need you to really look at me while I'm telling the story, all right? Because this is important. So I'm teaching geometry for pre-service elementary teachers and we're getting ready to talk about transformations. And like I always do, I ask my students, oh, how do you think about, for example, rotations when you hear the word rotation? because I always ask my students how they think about it so that then I can use their language when I try to formalize an idea. So I asked, how do you all think about rotation? And Timmy in the front row raises his hand, like, okay, call on me. So I call on Timmy. I'm like, Timmy, how do you think about it? And he said, are you all looking at me? He said, well, it's like, um, it's kind of like, uh, oh, I don't know. And um, they know that I pay attention to body, to eye, to face. And this is why it's so important for me that my students have their camera on. And I said, okay, Timmy, I'm gonna revoice and re-gesture what you just said and did. You said, well, it's kind of like a, oh, it's like a turn. And so Timmy's body had some sort of indication of how he thought about a rotation, but he wasn't yet ready to articulate it. The words right weren't there for him. And this is not surprising if we think about child development, when, uh, for example, a student learns about water and they want to communicate to you that they want water, they might point to the faucet, they might point to a glass, 
Um, and later they might say Wawa. Uh, and much later they actually learn the word water. And then much later they learn how to spell the word water. And this is exactly how we learn in mathematics. That first our body experiences it somehow. And then we learn words that are connected to it. And it's much later that we can interact with mathematics symbolically. And so today I want us to just think about ways in which we can engage our students in a bodily way with mathematics. And so this idea of that we learn mathematics through our body is something that we call embodied cognition. And this is exactly what this philosophy is, is that learning is body-based. This is one of my uh, favorite quotes. It says, mathematics like music needs to be expressed in physical actions and human interactions before its symbols can invoke the silent patterns of mathematical ideas. So to me, this says, hey, we need to let our students play with our ideas, with mathematical ideas, before we actually present them to them in a very formal way. So if we think about all the ways that maybe we learned mathematics where it was like definition, theorem, prove it, postulate, and we're just going through all of these things or here's the point slope formula, here's some examples, where we're not really even sure why it is that we're learning these things. And so uh, Skemp claims that we need to let our students interact with it before we start to formalize it for them. Um, so as such, under the lens of embodied cognition, as an educator and as a researcher, what I do is I pay attention to my students' body language, their eye movement, their gestures, because that tells me a little bit about what they know the knowledge that they might be in the process of constructing and the concepts that they're grappling with. So think about all the times that you might ask a student, okay, how are you thinking about that? And they kind of look up into space. It mostly means that they're trying to bring forth knowledge that they know that they've experienced somehow, but isn't quite yet accessible for them to articulate um, using verbiage. So um, this is some of the work that I've done with my students and a lot of the work that I've done has also been incorporated at the Air Force Academy, which is uh, why you see the cadets up there. Uh, but one of the frameworks that uh, Kita, Alabali and Chu uh, claim is that they have this hypothesis about gesture for conceptualization. And it holds that gesture activates, manipulates, packages, and explores spatial motoric information for the purpose of speaking and thinking. So a lot of times if the words aren't at, right at our disposal, somehow we're using our hands to try to connect or convey what it is that we're thinking about. Think about all the times that we might think about, uh, for example, a parabola. How many of us talk about, okay, the X squared function and we put our hands up like this? or we're like the cubic function and we do this movement, the John Travolta, right? So how many ways we ourselves try to convey mathematical ideas with our bodies? And of course we have sketches that include part of that uh, spatial motoric information. And then furthermore, gestures uh, schematic schematicizes information and this schemes process shapes the four functions. So these things kind of work together. Uh, this activating, manipulating, packaging, and exploring helps us to form schemes, and those schemes then inform also the gestures that we make. So, for example, once I recognize that the John Travolta is also the cubic function, I've packaged that in the gestures that I've made, as well as the scheme that I have in my head about the cubic function. Um, so, what we're going to do today is we're going to play. And there's a small group of us here today, which is fine. It's not a big deal. And so we're really just going to have um, two of you in one group and three of you in another group. And uh, Stephanie, I don't care how you do that, okay? Uh, and Stephanie, this is the only time you'll have to do the breakout rooms because we'll do the sharing back when everybody comes back. Is that okay with you? Sounds great, yep. 
Okay, perfect. All right, so this is what's going to happen. We're only going to have A groups, Stephanie, so we'll, I'll only have to share that activity. Um, so there's going to be two of you in one group and uh, three of you in the other. And what you're going to see, I'm going to put a link in the chat that has some tasks, some statements, theorems, however you want to think about it. And they're all from the geometry realm, just so you know. But there's going to be four statements there. And your task in your group is going to be to um, act out these statements and somehow be ready to portray what those statements say without using words, only using gestures. And if you have something here that you want to use at your disposal, whatever it is, I'm always amazed at what teachers have at their disposal and you wanna somehow use those as props, because I know I do this all the time. I'm always grabbing a pencil to do something to rotate or something. Uh, so if you have something in there that you wanna use, that's fine, okay? But then what we're gonna do is we're gonna come back and the group A will uh, share, charade out, act out their statements and group B will try to guess what their statements are and then vice versa. Does that kind of make sense? Can I clarify for a minute? I thought um, we were going to have a 1A and a, um, a B group, but then you yep. just said A groups. So Sorry. do you want a, a 1A? Yeah, we'll need 1A and 1B. Sorry. And 1B. Okay. I misspoke. Okay. Are there any questions about what I'm going to be asking you to do? It might make sense, Stephanie, to put me in the group of two, and then I could engage Callie as a possible third. Perfect. Yep. Okay, so um, let me go back in my slide here. So what I want to do, I'm right here. Uh, in the chat, I'm going to put two links. And there's going to be one for the A group, and that's the only link that you should go to because that's the one that has your statements. And then I'm gonna have a link for the B group and you should only go to that link because I don't want you to see what the other groups have. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, I'll go ahead and copy the link. Let's see, I have to stop sharing though for this. So this is the A group. Uh, Stephanie, who, oh wait, there. Uh, Stephanie, who's going to be in the A group? So for A, we have Michelle and Joe. And then for B, we have Sandy, Deb, and Shelby. Uh, is that what you wanted, uh, Michelle, that you be with a group that only has two or with two, three? Yes. Yeah, no, the, the two, and that works well because then I can, because Callie's here with me. She's oh, off the side, but she's still here. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Callie, feel free to show us your beautiful face. Okay. <laughs> here is the B group. And let me copy that link. I hope this works. Yes. Okay. So there are your links. So for the A group and for the B group, and then Stephanie's going to send you to your breakout rooms where you can start to create your little charades, your little acting out for the statements that are shown at the bottom of the handout. And we're going to do this for about 15 minutes. And then we'll come back, all of us back to this room, and then we'll have the A act out their statements and the B act out their statements. And you guys can try to figure out what they're saying. Uh, be sure to have fun. That's important. I clicked on it, it said access denied. Oh, dang. Yeah, and mine says request access. Uh, how do I do that, Stephanie, easily? Let's see, am I, I'm unmuted, okay. Um, so I believe it's usually in the upper right-hand corner, there's a share button. 
and you can make the link shareable like public access okay let me go there i apologize about this So once you click the share, it should be the second box on the bottom there. So, um, cause right now it's restricted. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to click on doing the B and then on share, what do I do? Uh, go to the bottom where it says get link and, um, highlighted in blue is changed to anyone with the link and okay. you should be able to copy. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I think I just did that for the B group. And so now let me do this for the A group. Okay. Yeah, it works now. Okay, perfect. Okay, I apologize about that. All right, go have fun and we'll be back here about 7.06. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think it'll tell you, I think, Stephanie, you're assigning the groups, so you should see something that pops up on your screen that says, hey, you're being sent to a breakout room. There they go. Perfect. One back. Hopefully you got to do one or two of those tasks. Um, and let's see, why don't we start with the 1A group, and you can again without using any words demo one of your statements and the b group will try to guess what the statement is so joe michelle and callie, callie, um, callie. do we just we can just do them in order what do you think joe do the first one and then we'll give the other group a, a chance and then we'll come back and have you do a second one Okay. All right. So you kind of, you got to watch both of us here. <laughs> okay. Do it again and make some, make sure they can see your fingers, not so, up so high. So there we go. <laughs> Shelby, you're on mute. Are you saying what it is? I know what it is. Some of the interior angles of the triangles, 180 degrees. Yay! Joe, that was a great spin. I love it. <laughs> that was my 180. Yep. <laughs> I like it. Okay. How about uh, Shelby, Deb, and Sandy? Sandy's muted. Go ahead and start. All right, it's a circle. Square. So there is a circle, square, parallelogram, just shapes. Saw circle. Perimeter? Mm -hmm. Where is that? That's a square. That's a square. Okay. And there's a parallelogram. A rectangle. A rectangle. Oh, okay, rectangle. Oh, okay. Right angles. A, a, a square is a rectangle. Uh, is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not necessarily a square. Close. <laughs> Joe, Joe has sort sort of. Of. <laughs> Joe's like, what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was this all of them? Is that what that was? All squares, all rectangles? Is that what that is? Oh, got it. Okay. Go ahead, Joe. Say uh, it. Uh, uh, all squares are rectangles. Okay. But not all okay. rectangles are squares. Well, it was just all squares are rectangles. Okay. Okay. Let's clap. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Team A. Okay. 
Okay, we'll go on to number two. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Through a point, there's exactly one line parallel to another point or another line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Wait, wait, can you say that? Can you say that differently? Because that's not what the statement says. Oh, okay. Through a point, not on a line, then there's exactly one line parallel to any another line. To the given line. Basically it. <laughs> All, yeah, basically, but not exactly. <laughs> Through a point. <laughs> how do you want your okay, so let's start here. Yeah, so how about show us what you have? A line. Mm -hmm. And a point not on the line. Very good. Then there's exactly one line through the point parallel to that line. Uh, Given line. Yes, very that good. Lines up. Very good. good. <laughs> so very you had good. it was just sort of a switch around yeah. in the way the order of that. The yeah, but right in geometry, how we really want our students to be precise about what they're saying, right? Like half sentences, half thoughts, don't formulate full thoughts. And so we really want to make sure that they say the full, complete, sexy thought is what I always say, <laughs> right? Um, and I really liked the manipulatives really just helped to bring all of the pieces of that statement because that's a difficult statement. There's so many pieces that go on with that statement. And so it's easy for students to kind of just pull pieces out, but not say it in a coherent and complete manner. So very nice, very nice. All right, let's see our second group B, what do we have? Did you get to work on a second statement? Woefully underachieved. No, we were telling stories. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about group A? Did you have another one that you would like to share? <laughs> we're the overachievers. Yeah. We're the overachievers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Okay, this one's all you, Joe. All right. Yep, I love that look. We got lines and you got planes. Parallel lines? Shelby, I think you have a thought. Yeah, I think Joe needs to say something so that way he'll show up a bit bigger because I'm having troubles with the size of the screen. I'm also not getting the stuff right in front of the camera either. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So. The triangle inequality? <laughs> no? No. No. Isosceles triangles? Mm -hmm. Theorem? What about it? If two sides of a triangle are congruent, then the angles opposite them are congruent? The base angles. Yeah, Shelby, put it together for us. Yeah, yeah I was trying to get somebody to say, with the trouble, right? I decided, okay, I need to hear somebody say triangle so we know what we're talking about. <laughs> Very good. Very good. 
you know, one thing as a teacher, just looking at, I, and I know right now it's easy because there aren't that many of us, but like just looking at how intensely people are really paying attention is great to see. So, let's see. Group B. It was the best I could do. I'm sorry I made you guys struggle so much. But. Oh, no. No, no, don't <laughs> apologize. Good. I understood you perfectly, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have a question about, we have a statement for group B that I'm wondering about. Uh-huh. You know, so kind of joked around and said, all right, for these four, I wouldn't act anything out. I'd draw it in GeoGebra and animate it, color it, you know, that sort of thing. So. Um, what is the statement? Do you want to share it? The second statement we had is um, if two lines intersect, then the vertical angles are congruent. Mm. So I want to hear the thoughts of the group on this, because like if you, you know, if you're doing this number and all that, or you know trying to do this number and show that they're the same thing, um, I've only personally really ever had luck with like showing different colors for those various angles or like translating a quadrilateral or something in GeoGebra and animating and showing that like you can slide that and get the same angle. You know, so I wanted to hear if anybody has any thoughts because it seems like so often kids really struggle with vertical angles, especially when they're not oriented the way they expect. You know, they hear vertical and they think they'll be above and below one another. Ideas from other people before I share something? Go ahead, Joe, you were doing something that I thought was appropriate. I was just practicing stuff, all right? So I just, I was, I was just trying with the pens, right? The, um, I'm just, I, I'm thinking out quiet. Um, <laughs> I always use the phrase opposite each other at an intersection, but. Let's see, Michelle, do you have any ideas? You're muted, Michelle. Sorry, no, I was just playing with pens like Joe was playing with your right. You were just kind of doing this thing with your pen. Yeah. But you'd still have to somehow communicate that the angles are the same. Yeah. So let me share, first of all, what a group did uh, at, at one of these workshops that I did. Um, she had she had like two big things available for her like two big sticks or something. So imagine like two pens. Make sure I don't spill this water. And uh, so she had something like this, and but they were much bigger than this. And then she would pop up from this side to this side, and this side to this side, or up and down, up and down. Um, and then there was another, they were like four people working together and they kind of just did things in a sequence. Um, but so those are things that you can do. And again, it's um, it, it really what it does, it brings attention to those two angles, kind of like how you're thinking Shelby that you use color. And so this bopping up and bopping down, bopping up and bopping down or side to side really is talking about, hey, I want you to pay attention to the vertical angles. But if you want an activity to do with the students, I don't know if you guys are familiar with patty paper. Uh, patty paper is literally the little pieces of paper that go in between hamburger patties. So it's like tissue paper. Uh, and so I like to do this activity because they can do it with, um, with folding. I don't know how well you can see this, not very well, but what I have is not at all. Let me get something darker. I'm sure I have a ruler in here somewhere, but I'm making do. So one of the things that I have my students do is simply make two lines that intersect on their piece of paper. Can you see these at all better? Yes, okay, good. And then the idea that I have students do is write down one of the angles is to bisect. So to fold their piece of paper so that you're bisecting an angle. So it's a fold. So literally what would happen is the students would make a fold coming down right through here. And when they do that fold, this angle ends up lying on top of this angle. And so I would ask guiding questions about 
what happens with these two angles? And of course we would give them names and they say, oh, they land right on top of one another. And of course, then we have a conversation of what does it mean that they landed on top of one another? Well, it means that they're the same measure. And then of course we talk about, well, what would happen if we bisected this, this angle and we fold it in the opposite direction? Well, then the other pair of vertical angles have the same measure. So that's an easy uh, activity to do with students. That doesn't require technology or anything fancy. It really just requires a piece of paper and folding. Okay, does that help Shelby? Yeah, so you mentioned earlier that you want them to, when they construct meaning, they're gonna move from some sort of movement or some non-linguistic uh, construct and then they're moving towards the linguistic, right? So um, I'm not so much concerned about getting them to see that those angles map onto each other at the same measure. I think that the, the term vertical angles is really unfortunate because you know, then we have to get into this idea of orientation. What does vertical actually mean? What does it mean in other contexts? And so I think it's just one of those poorly named things. The kids really, you know, when they encounter it in the wild, they have to know that word. You know, right. so I'm, I'm wondering about that. Yeah, I'm, you know, unfortunately I didn't get to name these, the names that we are gonna use because what do they wanna call them? They wanna call them opposite angles, but opposite angles are the words that we use for quadrilaterals for angles that are really on opposite corners. Um, so, I mean, I think it's just worth having a conversation with this might not be the best word, uh, but this is what it is. Uh, I don't, I guess for me, it's so inherent now that I'm like, I don't even know what other word I would wanna use. Like that seems like a natural word to me now, but I think that's just from my experience with the word vertical. Joe, you had a thought? No? It looks like you have a thought. No, I was agreeing with you. Okay, yeah, all right, good. So notice how important it is uh, even just eye contact, facial recognition. I do this all the time. Like, it looks like you have a thought. I think you're thinking something. And it's a way to bring students into the conversation. And maybe they're going to say, no, I don't, or I always have a thought. And a lot of times what happens with me is students say no. And then they're like, well, actually. And again, it brings them into the conversation. OK? So it's important for us to, to look at our students. So let me, um, let me just finish sharing my PowerPoint. Let me go here. And then I'll open it up for a few questions. Oh. Uh, so we did that. So just a little bit about some benefits to both the students and teachers regarding body movement awareness. Uh, it helps direct learners attention. So notice when we were, uh, when Joe was, you know, pointing here or pointing there, or when, when Callie was pointing to the angles, again, it just grounds the attention. So everyone is paying attention to the same part of, of whatever it is that we want to highlight. Um, again, fosters common ground by connecting familiar objects to unfamiliar objects. Uh, it facilitates identifying students' trouble spots. Uh, there's a whole lot of literature about gesture mismatch, where a lot of times students might gesture something correctly, but they articulate the mathematics incorrectly. Uh, and then also vice versa. Students can convey something verbally correctly but their gesture doesn't match with what they're saying. And both of those sorts of mismatches as a teacher tells me that there's something there that they're not totally understanding. And a lot of times when people uh, say something correctly, but their gesture is incorrect, what that tells me is that they're regurgitating information to me, that they've memorized something, but they really don't have a good conceptual understanding behind it. So it's really important to pay attention to both the verbiage and the gesture to see if those are in agreement with one another. Um, it also aids with communication. So for example, the Timmy story, um, genders, gestures generally accompany verbiage. So if we can somehow connect the gesture and the verbiage, it really ingrains that into the student's mind. Uh, one of the nice things and one of the things that I'm looking at currently in terms of my research is how does it aid and how, how does it um, help us with equitable teaching. 
because gestures can be a good non-linguistic -li non on-ramp for concepts. So for example, if our um, English or our students whose English is a second language aren't able to convey something verbally or symbolically, they might be able to convey it to us in terms of gestures. And it's a good way for us, again, to bring them into con the conversation and really recognize that there is something that they know that they're just not yet able to communicate to us verbally and certainly not symbolically. Um, so it gives learners access to concepts through body-based interventions and ways to express their reasoning in nonverbal ways. And this, of course, requires that we as teachers be attuned to our own gestures, to our students' gestures, and also help students become aware of the importance of gestures. Um, so one of the nice things that Abramson and Sanchez Garcia talk about is this scheme in which we can get to mathematizing. So students develop sensory motor schemes as solutions to interaction problems. And then each scheme is oriented uh, on an attentional anchor. This can be imagined in their head. It can be something physical like the pens, or it can be something virtual in the virtual world on a computer screen, something that we're paying attention to, uh, however it is that we're using our mouse and hovering over something. And then the symbolic artifacts are introduced. They assist with refining students' motor action control, and it shifts the discourse into explicit mathematical discourse of the environment. And I want to highlight this with these are my um, geometry students, and we're talking about stereographic projection. And the idea here is that I've asked them to do a stereographic projection of uh, a great circle on the sphere. And so my students all know that I pay attention to this. I encourage them to get up and move around. They know that this is part of the drill that we do in my class. And so in this case, my students actually started off by doing this like physically and imagining where the line would go through the sphere and where it would map onto the plane. And so that's what's happening right here. And then he kind of got tired of doing this and he got up and he starts imagining what would happen. And he's like, okay, so I have this great sphere. Can you all still see me okay? And so he has this great sphere. Thank you for that feedback, Joe. And so he's like, okay, so like, we're gonna start mapping like the North Pole and then like all of a sudden he sees it and that's what's happening right here. He knows right away his body is telling him that the great circle is simply going to map to a line that passes through the x-axis. And so his body told him all of that without having to do all of this kind of tedious work that I started them off with. That was the interaction of the sensory motor scheme. But then he kind of starts paying atten attention to what happens to the North Pole. That was his attentional anchor. And where did that go and started to follow through with that. And that's what helped him then to connect to this third part of really looking at the mathematics behind it and why that's going to happen. Okay, um, so let's see. I think that's the end of my slideshow. I do just want to emphasize the importance of paying attention to our gestures, asking our students to pay attention to our gestures. So lots of times I tell my students, put your pencils down, don't write anything just listen and look at my body or look at my hands or whatever, okay? But don't write anything, but rather listen and look at my hands. And then I also ask them to pay attention to their own gestures. What are their hands telling them about the mathematics that they're engaged with that maybe they can't articulate yet symbolically or verbally? Uh, and then I ask them to pay attention to each other's gestures also. That's really important in my class. That's all I have. I'm happy to take any questions or comments that you might have. Do you take any of this outside of ge your geometry classes or does it is it, where else do we use it? I mean, obviously you get the squared and the cube, you know, but. 
Yep. So I do it in my complex analysis class. That's huge. That's where a lot of my research lies right now. And so it's, uh, I do it in abstract algebra when we're talking about isomorphisms. That's huge in there. Uh, so, I mean, I can take it almost anywhere because, and certainly in calculus, you know, there's the increasing, there's the decreasing. Is it concave up? Is it concave down? Uh, all of these ideas. So, uh, but mostly most of the research that I've done right, that I'm doing right now is in the complex analysis setting. And the cadets that you, that I portrayed earlier, they're working on labs that are related to complex analysis. And that's where I'm paying attention, paying attention to the gesture that they're manifesting as they're working in the virtual world. So really any class that you can think of, as, as long as you're thinking about how you're conveying it uh, in terms of your own gestures. Other questions? I think with the rate at which technology is changing what we're teaching in math classrooms or what that looks like in the next iteration of NCTM, you know, spreadsheet-based reasoning and the importance of coordinatizing. You know, if I'm, if I'm helping out with state standards next go around, it's gonna be a ton of, we need to spend a lot more time emphasizing coordinate geometry, um, coordinatizing three space, kids need to know how to move in three space. All the work that we've done with 3D graphing, um, we, we, a lot of problems start to manifest in terms of orientation, not understanding what the origin is, not understanding how planes are, um, getting lost when you, the moment you rotate and get away from your original orientation, you know, kids really struggle with that. So um, as with the ubiquity of computing, I think this is a pretty important domain. Um, and I'm kind of encouraged to hear you know, about how you might ratchet that up or down depending upon, you know, what you're asking the kids to do and, and to know. So this has been cool. Oh, thank you, Shelby, I appreciate that. And there's certainly a lot that you can do in Calc 3 um, and even 3D graphing. I've, I have this idea in my head about, because I have this giant plane that you probably saw on my first slide. Let me share my screen again. Um, so, so wait, how do I go up? Oh, here we go. Oh, so here's one thing that I use right here. This is called a learning carpet. It costs about $300, but really if you have a grid floor or you can make it with painter's tape, there's lots of cheap ways to do this. But we're about to do taxi cab geometry and what do, um, the conics look like on taxicab geometry. So we first reinvented the conics on the Euclidean plane. And so that's what the students are doing right here. And some interesting questions came up because they're using the same piece of string and of course, you know, changing the, the different pieces that they each get. And then they get to uh, the vertices of an ellipse and they're like, oh, wait a minute, we ran out of string, why is that? And so there, these are things that we say all the time in class, but it's like, oh, wait, this happened physically to me. Why did this happen? And so that's when it's time for us to bring in the mathematics about what's going on right there. Not all of us just, okay, this step, that step, and that step. Uh, but in my, this tarp, so this is a giant 20 by 20 Cartesian plane that I created. And it literally is just a giant tarp with duct tape. And so I use this to do transformations, uh, Euclidean transformations. Uh, this is actually what's happening right here. They act as vertices, they act as points, uh, vertices of some quadrilateral. And then we perform the different transformations. We translate, we rotate, and they get to really know the different pieces of the definitions intimately. And of course, with reflections, we have different groups uh, where they again have to think about the perpendicular bisector of uh, the line of reflection for the pre-image point and the image point. Uh, so these are all activities that I've created. Uh, but in any case, one of the things that I want to do is I would like to have this in a room where right down the middle, I have a string coming down that meets the red tape at the origin so that then we can start to think about 3D graphing and start to imagine what this would look like. So that's one of my 
dreams, dream projects? Yeah, what came to mind is we did a problem um, in this accelerated algebra two geometry I teach. We do a lot of take home problems. We use the Phillips Exeter sets you know, as, as a source. Um, the problem was there's, it's like the spider and the fly problem, except you have an ant in the center of the top of a wall in a room. He's down about a foot. You have a fly in the opposite, opposite portion of the room. And then you blow this to a net. And then the orientation of whether or not you get into questions about can the spider crawl inside of the room? Is he allowed to pass through walls? Can he go on the outside? And then we started talking about orientation of planes. So that's immediately what I thought of there. Like, okay, well, I talked about with kids. It's like stranger things. You've got the upside down, you know, yeah. so you're underneath this whole space in which your spider is allowed to roam. Um, you know, just it's exciting to have the technology now to be able to investigate some of those questions. But now I'm, I'm wondering as a practitioner, like, man, how do you? How do you establish a naming convention without reinventing the whole thing? You know, is there some sort of industry standard? Maybe animators are using something that I'm not aware of where a kid could explore and then maybe be using that thing that might show up in the workforce later. I don't know. Yeah, I just got a fancy 3D printer. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do is thinking about how 3D printing might help. Um, to solidify concepts or even have concepts emerge. Other questions or comments? I know I've gone over the time. I apologize for that, but I do appreciate you all being here tonight. So I hope uh, you have something that you can take back to your class and adopt and adapt. I think I want to take this geometry class from you and do a conics in, in taxi cab geometry. That sounds really cool. I know that's oh, fun. You believe me, my students have way too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just so you know, uh, I have a grant to do an embodied uh, workshop, embodied cognition workshop. And I'm hoping that we can actually have it live and it'll be here at uh, Colorado State this summer. Uh, and I'll send the information to Michelle so she can sh uh, send it out to everyone and share it. Uh, but we're hoping to bring in 50 participants, uh, K through 16 teachers, because it's really about everybody learning how to use it. Uh, and like, for example, this TARP, how could an elementary teacher use it? How could a collegiate teacher use it? And thinking about all the different ways in, we, in which we could integrate embodied cognition into the classroom. Ready? Great. All right. I don't have anything else. Thank yeah. you again. I appreciate your That's time. Thank you.